So on Friday on our Live Sounds program, that's a 4 or 5 p.m. program every Friday afternoon, we actually had these luminous folks here. Uh, Rebecca <laughs> actually did the interviewing. Zach and Steve did the playing, and I'll tell you, you're in for a treat. These guys are great, and I'm sure Cynthia's going to be nothing but enhance the whole thing. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> no pressure. Give credit where credit is due. Kristen Wynn, who organizes so many literary things here, kind of expanding Yay. music and stuff, and I'll let you do the Yeah, I'll do a brief intro, and we'll get going. Awesome. But, uh, thanks, Wayne. <laughs> Welcome, thanks everybody. Deb and Bert are helping put this all together with all of Radio Boise's you know, volunteer staff, and regular staff, and everything, so... Um, this is walking out of here. Yeah. Is that the end? <laughs> One of the musicians left the room. Right, so I'm very happy to introduce you to um, Rebecca Evans, who is a friend and a, was in a couple of fiction writing workshops of mine over the years. And I learned earlier she was also, when she came back to school, Cynthia was teaching and was a student of Cynthia's too. So this would be kind of a cool I'm a connection. student of everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah you are. <laughs> A lifelong learner and a, an amazing human, and also a great <laughs> fiction writer, poet, creative nonfiction writer, and you get to hear some of her work tonight. Um, she's a military veteran, an Air Force veteran. She'll, we'll talk about that a bit, about how it plays into these guys um, and what Operation Encore does, and then we'll get to hear some awesome stuff from Cynthia's brand new novel, yeah. which is, is it actually officially out? Yeah, out? it was out last week, so. There we go. So, We've timed this well. Veterans Day is tomorrow. I don't think we even thought of that when we actually scheduled this. No, we did. Did we actually? We did, it? yes. Are you sure? <laughs> we <laughs> totally did. It was a while ago. Anyway, Rebecca Evans. Tremendous. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am so, like, thrilled. This is just such a great opportunity. So I'm sitting here with, like, I feel like the cream of the crop. So two military veterans and a New York Times bestselling author, right? Um, so I just, I'm going to introduce everybody to begin with, and then you'll get to know them more as we go along. So Steve Wilson, right here, um, award-winning singer, songwriter. He's a veteran of both the U.S. Army and the Air Force, go Air Force, sorry. He served 16 years as a paratrooper in the Army and then was an electronic warfare instructor for the B-52. His music is really unique. You're going to love it. It offers, like, this idea of the impact music has on humanity and the ability like how we unite you know as a human condition like it's really beautiful much of his music pulls in an autobiographical roadmap touching on fatherhood life circumstances and of course the way war affects the veteran so you're gonna love what he has to say next to him is Zach Slider and um, Zach was a field radio operator in the US Marine Corps he um, which seems like a contraindicated indication but he holds a degree in political science so you go marine political science we'll figure it out you'll hear from him <laughs> he's the lead singer and guitar player of a band called yuppie it's an alternative rock band based in dayton ohio and this band creates this honest music and you're going to hear this also in his lyrics and he quotes music to listen to when you hear the train passing the apartment you cannot afford after a night of drinking that you shouldn't be able to afford, okay? So that's how he describes his, his music, which I love. <laughs> From military Whoa. to civilian, businessman to bartender, he's worked many jobs, has worn many hats, but music has been, you know, his constant. And then, of course, Cynthia Hand, which I'm so excited, and I have studied under Cynthia Hand, and she is beyond spectacular. Um, New York Times bestselling author, several books, for teens, including the <laughs> Unearthly Trilogy, No Pressure, Cynthia. Yes. Um, the Last Time We Say Goodbye, My Lady Jane, My Plain Jane, with fellow mm. authors Brody Ashton and Jody Meadows, The Afterlife of Holly Chase, and the new novel, which just came out a week ago, that you will love and it will make you cry and you will never be the same again, called The How and the Why. And she's going to read a little bit from everything tonight, so I'm really excited. <laughs> Um, prior to writing for young adults, she studied literary fiction and earned both an MFA and a PhD in fiction writing. She's a badass. I don't know, can I say that on the air? Sorry. Um, Cynthia currently resides in Boise, Idaho with her husband, who we love because he is addicted to typewriters, um, along with her two kids, two cats, one crazy dog, and a mountain of books. So I'm so excited to be like with you guys tonight. It's going to be a great night, and you are in for a big, big treat. We're going to start off with No Pressure, Zach Sliver opening us up with some of his music. Thank you. Thank you. So the man has 
house I think I'm going For the bills they keep on coming I get older each day Well I guess that's what they say It's harder each day I'm getting pulled in every which way And lately I don't even know who I am That you 
trying so hard to hide. You wrap your empty arms around you, and you win to get some pain. And in your heart, you make yourself another promise that you know you're gonna break again. And then the cold sea rain keeps falling from the sky, and I can't get through to you. But I'll never let it go It's like a in a chain And it's pulling me down No doubt I'll reach out for the surface But I don't know where to go Baby, all this time You've always had the best of me I wish I knew the way To give you all the rest of me And I need a cold steel ray Where you walked away As the rain came down, <coughs> the world looked all brand new. And as the rain came down, I want to wash all your pain away. And as the rain came down, and let it wash the pain from you. And the cold still rain falling from the sky. Came through to you, but I'll never let you go. It's like a ball and chain, and it's pulling me down. Well, I reach out for the surface, but I don't know where to go, baby. All this time, you've always had the best of me. I wish I knew the way to give you all the rest of me. Underneath the cold steel rain, and underneath the cold steel rain. Underneath the cold steel rain, you walked away. So I want to start off and talk about Operation Encore because you two first met this weekend, right? But we you're did. both part of the same organization, which is Operation Encore, and this is a a veteran music project, and they bring veterans together. They've produced a few um, EPs, albums, right? Just people from all walks of life, all eras of service, all branches of service who have never met before. They come together and they like produce music, and it's amazing. What I want to talk to you guys about is like why bring veterans together through music? Like, what's your opinion? I mean, we go, we get together for war. Right, but music—it's a—it's a unique way to like link us. You know, I think music has been a uniting thing, and in, in all walks of life, obviously, and, and military is a microcosm of society as a whole, right? But you think about what draws people together, and sitting around a fire or whatever, and there's somebody always that has an instrument or a guitar, mm -hmm. and it just builds this community around that one commonality. It was, you know, you all have music. If nothing else, at the very end, you have that music. And who doesn't like to sing along to a sing-along song? And you know, and, and somehow in every deployment, we always manage to get guitars with us. Over the, <laughs> you know, in singing. any location. Yeah, right. I'm not, I'll never forget. I walked into a, 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 a MWR like room in Egypt, in the northern part of Egypt, and there was a, a Colombian, a bunch of Colombian Rangers, playing the instruments that they had there, doing some, uh, like classic rock songs and they didn't even speak English but they knew all the lyrics to the song. <laughs> they were doing Nirvana and all kinds of stuff too. Like, this is the weirdest thing ever but yeah commonality we just share it you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah it spans borders it spans language it spans culture it spans time yeah. Go ahead. Even when I was in the Marines like down at the smoke pit there was always somebody playing the guitar and that's where like I began to be like oh I like playing music I can do this and Operation Encore has done a lot I mean not only just getting us in the same room together, but like a lot of civilians don't understand a lot that happens in the military. So it's easier to talk to Steve about stuff than to talk to somebody else. And also, I just enjoy everybody's company in Operation Encore. I'm nervous. I'm this, really nervous. I'm going to help you relax. Have some more beer. There it is. <laughs> There's a commodity, though. I mean, I think the amazing thing about veterans, to me, is you get a group of people together who don't know each other, who are from every location, every background, 
and they come together for one common good and they get the job done, right? And my experience as a veteran, my experience as an artist, you bring veterans in the room and it's like one take and they're done. Like they look at each other and they there's a commitment that happens and there's a synergy that happens and it's an amazing thing and it makes sense to me. Like music becomes this unifying device, right? That it's hard to happen everywhere else. I know Cynthia will talk about like that same synergy that you have with your co-authors because it's really rare, I think, in the civilian world, but it's a common denominator in the military world. And so to me, it makes sense like, of course you guys unite through music. We unite through everything. Like there's, there's this automatic commodity that happens, right? But Operation Encore has been like a core for both of you, right? They've helped launch you and they're out there in the world. They're helping put veterans out there, their music out there in the world. So if you haven't heard their EPs or who they're supporting, this is the type of musicians they're supporting, right? Which is amazing. Um, where do you get your spark? That's why I want to know that from each of you, like the spark, the drive for your art. And Cynthia, I'll start with you since you haven't gotten this book yet. Speak oh, where yet. Where do I get my spark? Where do you get your oh, spark? For art. Your spark for art, place. not like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my spark for art. <laughs> I don't know. I think I think it's inside. You know, um, like I always write to um, to figure something out. So like to me. Art is about questions that I'm answering. And sometimes it's just about, you know, getting outside of my own head, you know, like yeah. playing in someone else's shoes for a while. And, and uh, but it, it always, it, to me, it's a little bit mystical where the actual inspiration comes from. Like, I think the question I get most often as an author is like, how do I get my ideas? You know, and I'm like, oh. I used to joke that I like got them in a back alley in Los Angeles, but like, but <laughs> from but, Idaho, <laughs> right? But really, I don't know. You know, it's just this kind of mysterious thing, and uh, it's a combination of what's going on inside, and then and then just the little neurons randomly firing in my brain. So like, um, but it's it's extremely fun. Mm -hmm. And cool sometimes. <laughs> How about you, Steve? I, I don't know. I was a, I, I've always loved music since I was small, but I also was an avid reader, like really early. And I, I fell in love with like Stephen King books, and so I fell in love with like the written word and how you could be clever and and then kind of and lyrically kind of matching up the. There's nothing that will attract me more than like a very very clever lyrical singer or songwriter or something. So um, for me. I've always, I write really just to get it out, you know, it's mostly heartbreak or anger or whatever else, so I'll just pour it into whatever I'm writing, but, and so I, hopefully that comes across, I guess, when I play it out, it's, it's like cathartic. <laughs> so your out. music became your punching bag. Yeah, therapy, right? it's yeah. my therapy for sure, mm -hmm. both listening and, and playing it, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. How about you, Zach? Um, experiences have always been the spark, um, or what I get my uh, stories from. Like even last night, who we hung out with, that. <laughs> well, you have to explain that because they were my best. Our new friend, Do you need a cigar? Gary Idaho, <laughs> took us to a cigar bar and. I have to plug them the vault in Meridian, Idaho, the Meridian, right? The only cigar awesome. shop in Meridian, Idaho. We went, I tried to smoke a cigar. It was scary. Go ahead. No, but I just, I think I draw a lot of uh, similarities in my music to the experiences that I go through or something that I watch. Or sometimes, like, he and I were chatting about uh, waking up and you're like, oh, you already have, like, part of the song in your head. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. So, like, I don't know. Kind of depends on where I'm at and what I'm doing. There's something magical and something surprising like in your sparks. I mean, for me, I always start to, to try to figure me out, mm -hmm. but it always turns someplace else, right? And then I'm like, oh, that's a surprise, you know? And I love that part of art, right? Whether, however you use art in the world. Um, okay, Cynthia, you're up. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so my new book is called The How and the Why, and it um, is from the point of view of two teenage girls. Yes, there it is. <laughs> One and of she them, has some books to sign. Yeah, I yeah. do. Yeah. Um, one of them is a 16-year-old girl who is living in 
here in Boise in what was then called the Booth Memorial Home for pregnant teens. And she is writing a series of letters to the unborn child that she's about to place for adoption. And then the other half of the book is, is that 18-year-old high school senior um, who, who was adopted. So it sort of moves back and forth between those two things. This is actually Booth Memorial on the cover, so I was so excited to, which is now called the Marion Pritchett School, but like uh, I was so pleased with how the cover worked out. So I'm going to read a little bit of Cass, who's the adopted girl, and then a little bit of um, S. She, goes, she calls herself S when she writes the letter. The letter so, S. Yeah. Yes, the letter S. Okay, Cass. I always think about my birth mother on my birthday, probably because it's one thing I definitely know about her, that on September 17th, 18 years ago, a 16-year-old girl had a baby, and that baby was me. It was just one of the things I grew up knowing about myself. I have blue eyes, my favorite color is purple, I like pizza, and I'm adopted. When I was little, my parents told me they picked me out of a cabbage patch. As I got older, my dad started to claim I was left in the backyard by an alien spacecraft. Those were meant to be jokes, but there was a real story there too, one they told me again and again, about a lonely couple who desperately desired a child, and a brave young woman who wanted to give a better life to her baby. It's always felt like a fairy tale written especially about me, one where I was the happy ending. But that's the thing, I think, frowning up at the ceiling. I'm the ending of that story. I don't even know the beginning. And I'm 18 now, I'm an adult, legally anyway. I get up and go to the doorway of my room, peering down the hall where I can see Dad's finally gone to bed. Then I close my door, lock it, and open my laptop again. Like I said, I think about my birth mother. When I was six and went to vacation Bible school with my friend Alice, and they told us the story of Moses and his mother weaving a basket of reeds and setting him afloat on the River Jordan, hoping to save his life. Or a dinner at another friend's house when I was eight, when I looked around the table and noticed that every single member of her family had the same nose. Or when my mom took me to a Broadway show when I was 12 and little orphan Annie sang this beautiful, poignant song about her parents, wondering if they were far away or close by, wondering if her mother played piano, if she collected art, if she sewed. And suddenly, my chest felt tight. Bet you they're good, Annie sang out into the darkness. Why shouldn't they be? Their one mistake was giving up me. That was when it really hit me. My birth mother was out there somewhere. Then I looked at my actual mother sitting next to me with this pained look on her face, but also like she was trying to be brave for me, and I dashed away the tears that had filled my eyes. I smiled because I didn't want her to think that's how I saw her and dad, like a place my birth parents had dumped me. After that, I thought about my birth mother more often on birthdays or those times that inevitably your friends start talking about the things they inherited from their parents that they wish they hadn't, a cleft chin or double jointed elbows or nearsightedness. It bugs me how much I don't know about that kind of thing, what's lurking in my genes, how there's this entire set of information that I'm totally clueless about. So a couple years ago I went online and did a few internet searches, not to find my birth mother exactly, but just to discover who she was, who she is, and maybe, by extension, who I am. Alright, now on to S. S is living with um, four other girls are living there. Um, at this school, and one of them is a 13-year-old named Britt. So that's as much as I'll give you. Um, when I was out in the hall, I heard crying. Gosh dang it, what is it this time, I thought. But it took a while to figure out, because whoever it was crying wasn't in the bathroom, or the kitchen, or the living room. She wasn't in Melly's room, where Melly was snoring like a bear. She wasn't in Teresa's room, where Teresa sat up and said, what's the matter? In a worried voice, because she'd heard the crying too. Or in Amber's room, where Amber jerked awake when I opened the door. That left Brit. Sure enough, her room was empty. Teresa and Amber and I stood at the foot of her bed, staring at the pile of twisted blankets and the dark spread of water over the sheets. Amber stated the obvious. So, Brit's in labor? No shit, but where was she? We went from room to room again, checking. No Brit. We wandered outside and started poking around behind bushes and looking in all the dark corners of the buildings. We must have been a strange sight, the three heavily pregnant girls in the middle of the night searching the grounds like we were on some kind of Easter egg hunt. But we didn't find her outside. We should wake Melly, Teresa said when we came back inside. Wait. I held up my hand for us all to be quiet. We stood in the living room, holding our breaths until there was a noise. Not a crying sound this time, so much as a groaning. I moved toward where the sound was coming from, which turned out to be a corner behind the couch. Britt wasn't there either, but there was a heating vent. I struggled to get down next to it, listening. The groaning came again. I straightened. Is there a boiler room? Somewhere that feeds to the furnace? 
None of us knew, but we went around checking doors until we found one in the back of the kitchen that led down a set of stairs. When we opened that door, we could hear the noise more clearly. We found Britt sitting on the concrete floor next to the water heater, the whole bottom of her nightgown wet with amniotic fluid, her face red and streaked with tears. Instinctively, all three of us dropped down to circle her. I'm okay, she said, wiping in her face. I'm fine. I was just curious about what was down here. Okay, said Amber. Well, what's down here is the water heater and the water softener and the furnace. Now we know, so let's go upstairs. No, I want to stay here. A spasm passed through Brit, and she made a rough, grinding sort of noise in her throat and sat back, breathing hard. I'm fine, she said again when she could talk. This X is what we call a predicament. Your baby is coming, Teresa said gently. You need to go to the hospital. No, Brit cried with a vehemence that startled all of us. She's not supposed to come for another week. I think babies make up their own minds about when they're supposed to come, I said. Tricky little creatures. I still have another week, Britt insisted. We all looked at each other helplessly. What could we do? Then another contraction hit her hard. Sweat popped out on her forehead. I could see the whites of her eyes rolling back. Britt, I said slowly, I think it's time, sweetie. No, she started to cry. I don't want to go. I like it here. You can come back, Amber said. We'll all be here waiting for you. Yes, we'll be waiting, Teresa added. Britt shook her head, sending her tangled red hair back into her face. I'm not ready. Britt, I said, Britt, come on. No, she groaned again. I didn't have a watch, but these contractions seemed pretty close together. I glanced at Amber. The last thing any of us wanted was to deliver a baby down here. We needed to wake Melly. We needed to call an ambulance now. Amber nodded and then slipped up the stairs. Britt didn't seem to notice. Britt, look at me, I ordered her, look at me. She shuddered and then met my eyes. Tell me about the baby, I said carefully. Tell us what she's going to be like. I'd heard her talk about it a dozen times, maybe more. This fantasy she had, which was so much easier for her than the reality. She's a girl, Britt panted. She's going to have red hair like me and freckles. I have freckles too, see, I said, pointing at my cheek. This counts as the one time in my life my freckles might have ever been useful. Maybe my baby will get them too. I glanced down at my belly, at you, X, and you shifted so hard I could see it through my shirt, like you were agreeing or something. A tear slipped down Britt's cheek. I get one more week with her. One more week. I don't want to go now. She sniffled and wiped her nose on the sleeve of her nightgown. She's going to be smart and beautiful and perfect, and when she's old enough, we'll find each other again. I'll tell her everything. That will be so great, I said. Yes, agreed Teresa faintly. What a wonderful day that will be. Another contraction hit Britt. She screamed with it this time. I could hear the faint sound of sirens. St. Luke's was less than 10 minutes away. Britt, I urged as gently as I could, it's time to go. No, she said, please. I know you don't want to, I said, but the baby is coming. You know she's coming. She wants out, and it wouldn't be good to try to stop her. You've got to think about what's best for her, Britt. That seemed to get through to her, finally. What's best for her, she repeated. Okay. I got an arm under her, and Teresa came in on the other side, and we hoisted her up between us and started for the stairs. We went upstairs slowly, one step at a time. We had to stop in the middle for another contraction. When we reached the top, there was Melly wearing rumpled hair and PJs and a perfectly calm expression. Hello, Britt, she said. Britt turned to me again and grabbed my arm. She looked like a little girl who'd swallowed a basketball. Why can't I be what's best for her? I knew exactly what she meant, but I didn't know the answer. We moved slowly through the kitchen and out into the front hall. Amber was there holding Britt's flip-flops and a hairbrush. Teresa hurried to her room and got her robe, which she tucked around Britt's shoulders even though it wasn't cold. Red and blue lights started to blaze through the windows. The sirens were off now, but there was a squeak of brakes as the ambulance pulled up to the curb. Britt seemed calmer. She walked without help to the bottom of the stairs. The paramedics were cheerful as they helped her into a gurney and loaded her into the ambulance, Melly climbing in beside her. They didn't turn the sirens back on as they drove away, only the lights. We lingered on the front step, me and Amber and Teresa, the lights splashing us like fireworks, and we watched the ambulance until it was out of sight. Then we came back in and went off to our rooms without another word. And I came here and sat down and tried to think of how I would describe it all to you. What happened? What I feel now? How do I feel? I don't know. Sad, scared, tired. And like I'm not ready either. It's weird. But I don't want our time to be over just yet. I guess I'm not ready to let you go. Even though this is a fiction Amazing. story, it's so personal, right, for you. Yeah. And uh, and I want to touch on that because I want to talk about all the discomfort in, 
like all of us as artists, like what we're putting out there in the world, like this uncomfortable space that we go in as artists and then we make you uncomfortable, right? <laughs> You're <Yes>. welcome. <laughs> um, so yeah, I wanna talk about like why this story for you? Um, well, I'm adopted, um, and the very first draft I wrote of this book was trying to sort of fictionalize my own um, story, which was, um, you know, this girl living at the Booth House in 1978, which was the year that I was born, and then, and then the 18-year-old, you know, around the year, you know, like in the, in the late 90s. And it, I just couldn't make it work. I couldn't write something that was so autobiographical, and I had a hard time, time with it. And when I rewrote it, I just really tried to like capture the emotions that, that were mine, but really give the characters their own story, which has always been kind of a lesson for me. Anytime I set out to write something that's too close to home, it ends up not working. Um, and then I just have to reframe it a little bit and, and, and let the characters become their own people, and then, and then it works out. But it surprised me how I, was, I actually found it much easier to write from S um, than I did from Cass, and I think that was because writing about Cass made me kind of confront some uncomfortable questions about how I felt about my own adoption and and how that that works out. So yeah, it dragged me into the... And you talked about like as a mother, like you could understand what that experience would be like. So do you want to touch on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think with us, some of it was that I was, you know, I was closer to her age too, you know, like I was... Um, in the year 2000, I was close to close to her age, and so like I just knew what that world looked like a little bit better. And then I also knew what it was like to like carry a child and understand, you know, the worry that comes with what's going to happen when they're out in the world. And so yeah, it came much more easily to me than I would have guessed. And you too, like writing from this autobiographical discomfort. Mm. <laughs> yeah, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> yeah. I, like point to people in the audience um, randomly. <laughs> I, tr I I have a hard time writing from another person's perspective, um, and I don't know. It's I I've, I've written songs about myself more than other people. I'm kind of selfish in that way. Um, yeah. What do you think? Does it make you feel uncomfortable, like? if you put something that's so autobiographical out there in the world, then the people that listen to your music come to you with this knowledge of you that mm -hmm. normally we sure. don't walk around with, and what's that like? Yeah, that's, it's, that's interesting. And, I, and another thing is, she, like I said, it's like my therapy. So when I, even when I play these songs over and over, sometimes I still get choked up because I get caught up in the lyrics mm -hmm. myself, and I, I actually get tears in my eyes when I'm singing a line. And uh, so they're still so emotional, but I guess that's why, I don't know, they, they come across, I guess, more authentic, I would hope, because they, they're real, it's just what I feel, so, I don't know, I don't, I don't feel like there's an infringement upon, you know, the inside into my head, because I've always kind of lived fairly openly out there, like, mm -hmm. this is me and all my skeletons and dirty laundry, and take me as I am, because I'm not going to pretend to be somebody I'm not, kind of thing, so... I think to address that, and then I want to hear from you, is I think um, you're giving people privileged information and you hope they don't use it as ammunition, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but on top of that, I think there's this responsibility of like, hopefully my experience helps you, right? Or maybe it gives you permission to like share your experience. Like there's that idea that you go with, but when someone approaches you, you're like, they have no right to know that about me, but I gave them that information. It's, it's, it's a hard situation. Yeah, Zach, what were you gonna say? I've, on our new EP for Yuppie, we are, uh, I wrote a song called Scoundrel, and I was 110% apologizing for being a scoundrel. I think dealing with PTSD for a while, I was unchecked, and I didn't treat everybody nicely. I, I had to write that song to almost assassinate my old character and become a different person and kind of take that rebellious nature that I had and kind of put it to bed. Mm. What you just said, I feel like it's not the core of a, a relationship. You know, you give 
this license to somebody else and into your head, into your thoughts, and trust that they're not going to use that information against you. I mean, that's kind of the foundation, isn't it? <laughs> it's very vulnerable, right? Do you feel like with your writing, like you're really putting your vulnerability out there? Yeah, well, and this is the first time, this week has been the first time that I've really, like, talked about, like, so many people have asked me questions about my own adoption. And I was like, oh, crap, yes. That's what happens when you write a book about okay. I wrote about this. Now I'm going to have to write about it or talk about it, you know, and, and uh, yeah, so... So that's fun. But I was a little used to it because um, one of my older books about five years ago, The Last Time We Say Goodbye, was was very much based on um, my uh, emotional journey when my younger brother um, committed suicide. And so, like, I learned how to sort of balance the, the questions and sort of compartmentalize a little bit and, and be able to, like, dance back and forth between. Kind of distance yourself. Yeah. Like from the artist to your real life. Yeah. I want to talk to you a little bit about home, Cynthia and I have had this conversation like she this is a a book that takes place here in Idaho and typically that's not the foundation from where you write but this idea of home what that means to you and especially from you two as veterans like how we define home um so let's hear from you first like the definition of home and like where you're getting that in your setting and your writing and how you use that in your art yeah, um, my writing didn't really start to take off until I learned to write about place. Um, I love to tell that to my students so because they tend to think of um, writing about setting or places as being kind of like stage dressing to their stories sometimes. You know, like they've got this blank stage and they put props on it and move the walls in. And, and uh, that's how I started out writing and nobody was very uh, interested in anything that I wrote when I wrote that way. And then when I started writing about... Um, Idaho, um, back when I wrote literary fiction, um, I, I didn't write about Idaho because I didn't want to be seen as sort of like the local hick. You know, <laughs> I was the only person from Idaho in, a, in my group at that time. And like, and so I just tried to make my settings more universal. And then after reading some Flannery O'Connor where she talks so much about using the things that you have inside of you, using your spaces and, and your sort of toolbox and if you're not writing from about the places that you know, you're not using the tools that you have. So then I was like, okay, fine. So I started writing stories about Idaho, and then everybody got very excited about that. And, and that was a lesson that I learned and have continued to, all of my books have a very um, large element of place. And and so, but now, but this time I got to write about, about Boise and that, and Idaho Falls, some too, and, and uh, which is, home for me and um, it was interesting to to write about and and then think about how the readers would see this place from the outside that I really saw from the inside so that was fun yeah you gave this camera lens right for them to kind of get a glimpse I wrote about the inversion I felt so guilty <laughs> I was like well maybe it'll stop people from coming <laughs> but there was just a scene where it was just so reflective of her mood she was like staring out and there was a sort of brown hovering over the city and I was like, oh, this is bad. I'm writing about the inversion, but. Yeah, but you were doing your part true. in like slowing down the population and That's right. That's right. I, I was doing a service right there. Yeah. But I think for <laughs> veterans, home ha takes on a different definition because I think of the experiences that end up part of your DNA as a veteran. And it's not necessarily your home, but it starts defining you like home would for other people where you grow up. And veterans constantly are shifting. You're able to adapt very quickly. You learn how to say goodbye really well. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, but you learn how to like get in and make family very quickly as well. So a little bit from you guys about what home means to you or however you want to define that. I, I personally think home is where I hang my hat. Yeah. In the beginning, it was really hard feel comfortable like when you leave your family and your friends and you're constantly in places where it's un like you don't you don't know these places but after a while you start to have find camaraderie with people and a comfortability of being alone and after a while being happy about being alone you can I don't know it's freeing mm -hmm. for so me I, yeah. 
I just want to touch you. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, this is not visual. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I moved pretty much every three years of my life. My dad was retired chief master sergeant in the Air Force as well, so I, I kind of didn't know any other world. My mom's from England, so we had a home in England, family in England. We had, you know, we never went back to my grandfather and grandmother's house or anything. So there was no, like, geographical home for me ever. You know, so. I think back to deployments, and you know, you look forward to getting home, home to your family. Really, it's just your family you're looking to get back to. You, you know, cause, you know, every time I've ever gotten back, I think we moved immediately after we got back. So, um, so home is it, it becomes a group of people, or you know, the environment you're in, and, and the military, like you said, you adapt and you learn to be very independent, and you make your space and build your nest wherever you are, whether that be in a Humvee in the middle of the desert or in a B-52 in a little corner of it. You, they say build your nest, you put all your stuff up, make it yours, and there's your little home. But I think back now, deployments and being like spending Christmas, you know, deployed in the middle of a war with a bunch of other buddies and playing music in, in you know, Christmas in the middle of the Indian Ocean, for example, that was kind of more of a home to me than anywhere else I've ever been, you know? Those things become more home, and you look back with that, I don't know, I guess glorified remembrance where you forget the suck and you just <laughs> <laughs> remember the cool times, but. Yeah, I do think, I agree with that. I think home, um, and it depends on how you've grown up, but I think home for me has been continuously a movement, and it's always been who is in my life, right? And that defines, it's not a place. It's, it has nothing to do mm -hmm. with geography or location. It's more of an experience. And I think the military trains you to like do that so that you don't get pissed off, right? <laughs> you, <laughs> you like handle it and, and it's a skill set. It's a skill set. Um, so Steve and I was, Steve, I was hoping we could hear from you play a song. And if you have anything, anything like well, I have one that kind of fits into what we were just talking about as far as the personality you're putting in your own, I guess, skeletons out there for the world to judge you and hope they don't use the information against you. This was a song I wrote with my band, The Black Doves, back when I was still in the Air Force in the latter part of my career, and it's called Beautiful Tragedy, but it was just basically a no kidding, stop fooling yourself and look in the mirror and admit to what the hell you really are kind of a song. So. Anyway, this is beautiful tragedy. Not to bring down the room. <laughs> <laughs> There's alcohol here. <laughs> <It's so better. laughs> Sometimes it's perfect, and you don't even know. Sometimes it's wonderful, but you still wind up letting it go. Sometimes you're blinded by the truth staring back at you. Sometimes it's hard to accept the things you know that are true. Prize open your eyes to a face that you recognize. And in that moment of sin, you add up everything you've been and the drop in the bucket. The drop in the bucket is where it starts to run out again. You can't go back. Can't go, no, you can't go back. But you can't stop looking back. Oh no, you can't stop looking back. So you reach your epiphany. Inside, well, it, it rise open. 
don't even know Sometimes it's wonderful We'll take a break after Zach. So I wasn't going to play this, but I feel like I should play it. <laughs> <laughs> the song's called Home. I thought it was just, I thought I had to. Yeah, you do. Yeah. This is the tuning song. It's one of my faves. of the programming um a fantastic first half there's going to be a really cool collaboration between these two and cynthia to finish off the night and um yeah just take it away rebecca awesome thank you christian um so i'm going to read from my memoir called navigation and uh gosh what do you need to know about this book um it's a slice of my life following my experience in the Persian Gulf War. And I love the idea of navigating. Like we navigate through life, we try to make choices. We keep relearning lessons over and over, like until we figure it out. But my job in the military was a flight planner. So I was very familiar with navigation, not just metaphorically in my life, but also very physically and real in the military. And so the book has that weave throughout it. And uh, all you need to know is this is a memory. And um, I do want to say there's a trigger warning. So it does involve um, childhood sexual assault. So if that's a challenge for you, like take care of you. Um, yeah. 
My sister was my wall. She had placed her bed between my bed and the door, between my stepfather and me, night after night throughout her preteen life. She had done this so he would get to her before me. I felt bad for myself as I lay in darkness, biting my pillow, listening to her pleading him to stop, knowing I would still be next. I didn't understand then that she wore the brunt of his brutality. She went first, and he would bear less anger and violence towards me after. I didn't understand how she saved me night after night. I thought us unrepairable in heart and spirit and body, and we later could recover at least a little. I almost forgot about her tenderness after. The after time proved the most powerful. Once he left, she dragged our beds together, both of us still smelling of him. His putrid sweat and Old Spice aftershave, his breath lingering with leftover fried chicken mixed with sour milk. She wrapped me into her arms, curled me close like a miniature mother and smoothed my wet hair from my face. She had arrived as a ward from foster care in a frail package, that body of hers pocked with cigarette holes as if someone thought her an ashtray. She washed my hair for me, carefully, keeping soap from my eyes when she rinsed. One time, I asked her about Mother Mary as I overheard the name mentioned at a bus stop. What's a virgin, I asked. A woman who hasn't been loved, she said. I haven't been loved, I said. You've been loved by me, and neither of us are virgins, she said. And the muscles in her face tightened as she bit those words, and I realized this idea upset her, though too young to understand as I was only five, maybe six. There were times the two of us hid in mother's walk-in closet, the air filled with stale mothballs and lemon oil. We would become something else, someone else in that quiet land of little girls pretending to live glamorously. Which ones, she asked, standing in front of mother's shoe cabinet. The heels hooked onto dowels, the toes facing forward, lined alongside one another like soldiers prepped for war. Most of the styles look the same, only different in color and leather, fake leather, embossed, patterns of synthetic snake, skin or crocodile-like armor, baby breath blue, yellow so pale it reminded me of soiled snow, crimson red that dimmed black in the crevices. The darker blue made me think of violet bruising and I felt bad for that pair. I would pick the pink ones, always, flamingo pink. I slipped my tiny feet, filling only half, and the two of us would laugh as I tried to stand straight, jut out my hip <clears throat> like a grown-up. In the aftertime, at night, she waited until my heart slowed and my eyes slid low, and then she'd sing the same song in every aftertime she never forgot. Her breath smelled like butter corn. Her body offered a cocoon, and I I could finally rest. And this is like a really ugly early draft, which I love when artists put out their stuff that's really unpolished and unprepared. So here you go. That um, all look prepared. <laughs> that was very well. That was polished. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is a poem called Unlearned. I, I made that word up. It's not really a word, is it? Unlearned? You don't know? I'm not the so. <laughs> <laughs> I look to Cynthia for everything. Um, but um, I love the idea of, you know, we go through life experiencing things that we learn. And I was thinking about, like, all the things I've tried not to learn. And I thought I'd write towards that. And maybe this will be in a chapbook someday. I don't know. I don't know what I have planned for it. But here it is. I've learned not to keep my nails long thanks to warfare training and a baby with a feeding tube and in need of lung suctioning. I've learned not to spend much time on my hair thanks to soppy British air transforming shape into mindless curls and feeding babies before I fed myself 
let alone fix my locks. I've learned not to ask for help because leaning towards someone meant they'd vanish, not affording me a soft place to fall, or they'd forget or unrespond or uninvite or unhear my pleas. I've learned not to break silence out of fear of an acceptance or worse rejection or even worse, if possible, pushed back into the quiet of mind screaming, remembering strong hands and hardened fists. I've learned not to flirt to avoid sexual attention from men wanting to take that private piece and never bothering to understand any piece of me as if I'm a puzzle and the only corners that matter and the picture that is more interesting to them if they leave it all undone, jagged and jigsawed. I've learned not to eat pork or shellfish or meat or dairy with me to care for my soul's sacred feeding and sustain myself on clouds and wine and sorrow and memory spilling as though a dietary change will alter my route or heal my vacancies. I've learned to not cut my son's neck while shaving his face, a skill not addressed in parenting books, a skill I wish was used on me and my own twice neck slicing as if I could put back together me screw by metal screw like the tin man so I could stand straighter. I've learned. I've learned. Conversation. So would you say <laughs> having lived life, I mean they say having that kind of trauma at an early age and I was a sexual abuse victim when I was a kid too. And I think coming to terms with a lot of stuff in myself later in life, after I got out of the military, you know, that lived life in fight or flight and you were just determined never to be disrespected again, do you think that is what attracted you to the military? Mm. That's a great question. I think the military became my parent, right? Here's the line in the sand, here's mm. right, here's wrong, here's something that can help you heal like this pain in your childhood and I think definitely absolutely absolutely I think that the military gave me the space to have like a clear understanding of what boundaries not to cross and then you could be safe there so absolutely I was 14 when I left home I was 17 when I joined the military wow. so I'm a I'm a high school dropout <laughs> yeah. yeah you're really brave for writing that thanks for sharing it yeah and the interesting thing um, I wrote this initially in third person, so all of my memoir stuff, Allison's nodding because she read it yeah. that way. And it was like her, her, she, she, and I couldn't like own my story. And um, when I first entered um, my first MFA program, one of my professors said, what if you did that in first person? I mean, you might not be able to, right? It's like a hard story to tell and own. And so I stood in my dorm room reading this out loud and I could not get through it. And I thought, if I could read this out loud in front of writers, like I'm a superhuman, like I could do anything, mm -hmm. right? And it gave me like a sense of my power back, just owning my story. And I thought, if I could have my voice, someone else could have theirs. And it really, it helped a lot. And I don't know, do you, do you find that in your own music? Like you, you write about your stuff, you're writing about your stuff in a fictional way, but it's still your stuff and you're giving voice to like, these hard, painful things. Yeah. Uh, is it open? Or yeah, yeah. Can <laughs> like, like somebody else? Speak. I You're mean, on. I, yeah, I used trauma uh, when I went through in the Marines. And I, I, similar, like I put a man in prison for five years because he tried to sexually molest me. And the, the and that's really heavy, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, no, I had a buddy that was there and he was the first. Like, he did it so I wouldn't. So, yeah. Yeah. Vulnerable. I, yeah, I Vulnerable. think for me, it was, you know, looking back in hindsight, 2020 and, on, and all it is, was that I was trying to prove something to myself, obviously. That's why, you know, went for the hard schools, try to get a ranger contract right out of, you know, right off the bat. And, um, went to you a became unit. a paratrooper. Yeah, I went to a unit that required you know more of a of a effort, and that could you could feel like you're invincible. You know, therefore 
no longer could you ever be taken advantage of. And then, it, you know, you, then you deal with the own, your own issues internally, like, what's wrong with me, really? I mean, I'm, obviously, I deserve this kind of thoughts. And I don't know, it's just, it, I, I found that my military career became kind of a way to prove that I was worthy of standing on my own and that I deserved respect, damn it, you know, and I would get it. I think the military, like academia, offers you a measurement stick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? That you're measuring up, that you're doing okay, regardless of what might be going on outside of you or to you, right? So you have this measurement stick that you're, you're okay, you measure up, right? Cynthia, what about you? Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I listened to my, my dad, my dad, um, was a high school dropout who joined the military, um, and I think, I, I think that what what you were saying about that became like your measuring stick. I could see that in him. He doesn't talk about it a ton, but mm -hmm. like, um, but yeah. Um, for my own stuff, I, I think, I think you. One of the reasons that when when I so my first series was a sort of. Not, I, I don't want to say fluffy, but it was during the twilight time, and it was like a paranormal romance, and like, and I worked on that for four years, and then at the end of that time, um, my editor asked me, and then at, during that, at the end of that time, paranormal romance just kind of crashed and burned as a genre, right? People were done reading that stuff, which was good for me in that I was allowed to pick what I wanted to write next, and um, and so I was going over these ideas and and got to this idea that I had been kicking around and, and writing a little bit about this girl whose brother had died and my brother had died and I talked about it with my um, editor and she was like yes that one that one that one and I and there was a part of me that was like are you trying to like make money off of the most painful thing that I've gone through you know mm -hmm. like is this am I exploiting this mm -hmm. experience in order to like profit off of it somehow um, and I really had to wrestle with with that first. Um, but what I came to understand about it through writing it and then especially after it's been out there in the world and people, I get, I get letters about that book every single day um, from people who... About your brother's uh, suicide. About, about book that about, book right. and usually about their brother's suicide right, or about okay. their, you know, um, experience with with it and what and what I wanted to write when I when I started writing it was uh, I wanted to write an accurate portrayal of it because I felt like in in teen fiction especially suicide is seen very romantically mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to show just a, a really gritty aftermath of what it actually looks like and um, talk about that a little bit because I, I love how you portray that well I, mean, I don't love how you portray that but I mean yeah. you, you get real with that well, I kept seeing this. Uh, there was a writer who, who wrote a book about <coughs> teen suicide that I won't, I won't say, which is beautifully written and a great narrative. But I kept seeing all of these fan, like videos of of the girl sort of dramatically falling to the floor with her bottle of pills or like the the sort of romance around it, which I think my brother also had a very romantic view of suicide before he did it. So, I really wanted to write something that that sort of pushed back the sort of Madame Bovary version, the teen, like, Madame Bovary version. So I want, but I didn't want to, like, drag the reader through the suicide itself, but just to, just to think about the things that, that we don't typically think about. Like, what does the aftermath look like? What is the cost? What's the financial cost to a family? What's, what are these costs? What does this look like? And so, like, um, and so I, I sort of dug in, in, into writing about it, just the details, um, the sort of grittier details of it, um, just, to, just to have it out there. But it, it amazes me how much it, it has spoken to people, um, both people who hadn't really, who were romanticizing suicide and hadn't really thought about it that way, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then also people who had been through it and really felt like, you know, they're, it reflected in some way or helped them in some way deal with their own feelings. And to me, that that was worth all of the pain and suffering that I had to go through to write it. Because I used to write in the library, like when I was writing the Unearthly series, I would write in the Pepperdine Library, like um, looking out on the ocean. And I had to stop doing that when I was writing the last time we say goodbye because I would cry 
and people would worry about me. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to like go home and like hole up and, and get it out in, in private. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I worried about it constantly about about what because you want a certain level of objectivity as a writer too you know and I and that's it's just very hard to stay objective when you're writing about something like that so something so personal mm -hmm. I think what I love most about this group here is this discomfort in writing about these really hard things you know suicide PTSD veteran experiences loss um, abuse and it's a conversation that needs to happen I mean oftentimes I think, for me at least, I write about it because I'm trying to just figure myself out, right? I start there and I don't plan on ever sharing it with anyone and I'm like, oh, I already wrote it. Like maybe this, somebody else will, you know, get something from this, right? And it's with that intention. But it's very vulnerable. But I wanted to talk about like the discomfort. Like you have to go through like a discomfort, an uncomfortable place, right? But then you're pushing that out into the world. And we talked a little bit about that on live sound. Like, okay, this is a really uncomfortable sound. Here you go. <laughs> yep. And have at it, yeah. So let's talk about that. Like, you go through it first, and then you're, there's a responsibility, too. We're, like, putting that on other people. You touched on it when you said, am I exploiting this thing? Because mm -hmm. absolutely, you feel like, I'm, am I just exploiting my own sadness to try and make money off of it? Or, but I, I, I don't think I've ever been monetarily driven by the whole music thing ever. It's like you said, we, we talked about this. We're like, man, we'll play anywhere. We'll play on the yeah. street corner. I don't care for free. We didn't. And so, you know, like yeah. the therapeutic effect of it is also great. Uh, yeah. Also, <laughs> exactly. I'm take the money. Wait for <laughs> Cheetos to sponsor me. <laughs> you gotta pay me for my misery no, by I, all uh, means. It, it is interesting. Are you exploiting? you're paying for money. And at some point, no. I mean, the song Scoundrel I was talking about earlier, I had to write that to change, like like I said, assassinate the character that I used to be. And in that, I am nervous every time I play it because it's so close to who I was. And I mean, the first lines in it are, I've been a scoundrel most of my life, probably why I don't have no kids or no wife. That's like Jesus, oh my God! <laughs> like it's not very on the nose, and I think a lot of my writing can be on the nose. Very direct. Yes. Very direct, and writers do it different. Like we try not to be on the nose, right? I mean, it's like almost the opposite effect, yeah. but both of them still punch you pretty hard. Like it doesn't matter if you it's hit a it. Tom Petty way of dancing around what you're trying to talk about. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. try to mirror both those things. So what happens to you as an artist when you're writing in this really uncomfortable, vulnerable, painful place? Like what happens to you? I mean, is there an alchemy? I like what <laughs> you said about out. therapy. Yeah, you know, like I think, I think it. I I struggle through the things that make me uncomfortable are the things that I know are the most important things to end up in it. You know, like. To look at the hard subject without flinching, without mm -hmm. averting your eyes, right? Like mm -hmm. to to just stare straight into it. Um, that is so hard. But that's if you do look away in that key moment, then then you lose the power of the thing you're writing. You know. Yeah. So I just try to like look at it straight. You know. And For me, it's just a lot of second guessing and internal monologue of your own worst friend like this song sucks it still sucks I wish I would have written it differently <laughs> <laughs> I can't play guitar worth a shit I suck <laughs> so yeah and then that and then you start realizing god now I'm making it all about me well it is about me but I need to put it out in the world I think that's kind of the key is just letting go of it mm -hmm. and uh, not being selfish being selfless about it and saying hey I'm glad it means something to you because like, people ask me what's this song about and I'm like what is it about to you uh, I mean, I could tell you, but I'd rather not, <laughs> you know? But that's, the, that's what happens when you write songs about yourself. So <laughs> how do you get out of that? I don't know. I don't think you get away from writing songs about you, or writing anything. It becomes about you on some level. What yeah. about you, Zach, with that discomfort? I think living in that, like writing in that, is hard at first because it's coming to terms with 
decisions you've made or like bad things you've done. But I think there's freedom in putting it on paper and then putting it out there. Like you're not chained to this hidden thing anymore or something. It's freeing. Um, I don't know. I, I when I was a kid, my father's a pastor, and I used to listen to people's prayers because I was like eight and waiting on a ride <laughs> from my dad who's praying for 50 people. And I used to listen, and it was always like I hate my job, my husband's cheating on me, but I can't because God won't want me to. And that kind of instilled this rebellious nature in my heart because I was like, no, like if your husband's cheating on you, leave him. If your person, like if you hate your job, get a new job. And there's just these holes that people like put themselves in and they're not willing to like make a ladder to get out of these things. And I just, it, that's what really drove me to want to play music. Um, to just show like, if you want to do anything, you can do whatever you put your mind to. So is there a point, I like... I don't answered the question. No, you... No, you <laughs> Perhaps some new points. It, well, I think, um, yeah, you bring up new points. Like, for me, initially, I journal. And I think I'm trying to look for resolve. And there's usually never resolve, right? And, uh, and it just becomes understanding, right? And then I go, okay. And with that, you kind of accept the situation or you accept, like, your song about being a scoundrel, it's like... That's just acceptance of like where you were at that time in the space. So, a little bit about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like was, acceptance, resolve. Like when you're when you're I, I, getting so personal. I mean, it's essentially an apology. Mm. And exactly. It, um, mm. It's interesting. Sometimes an apology is just not enough. You know, so this is me relating to past relationships where I, I don't know, I think everybody's really quick to blame the other person and it's really hard to be like, oh, it was all my fault. And so realizing that and just taking ownership that I used to be an asshole. Yeah. And, and I'm not gonna hide behind like me having PTSD. Like, I, it doesn't excuse anything that I've done. But now realizing like, after going to therapy and not taking the 15 pills the VA wants you to take and just kind of seeking out better ways to walk mm -hmm. through your life. Cynthia, for you, resolve, apology, like what happens with your writing? I really liked how you said that it doesn't resolve you, you come to understand. Yeah, yeah. And I think that I think that's a big part of it. When I was writing the end of that book, the last time we say goodbye, I had given myself a certain amount of time to finish it and realized that I was slowing down. Like, I was not, I was creeping along writing the end. And you're a fast and furious writer, because you um, have Somewhat, I mean, it depends. Yeah. But like, I was just really trying not to finish it. Like, I had it laid out, it had momentum, every scene, every sentence really had this momentum behind it and I was dragging my feet. And I had to at some point just stop and say, why am I doing this? Why am I like sitting down to write? I've got the momentum, I've got the energy, it's going, I know where it's going, why am I stopping myself? Mm. And I think um, at some point I realized that it was because I didn't want it to be over. And I was trying to avoid writing the moment where she has to let go, you know. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then once I had sort of put that into words, like, okay, this is what I'm doing. And then I sat down and finished writing it, you know, and, and was able to get through it. And felt relief, you know, when I was done writing it. But, but I really dragged my feet for a while there. And I think it was because I was working th through it and also because I didn't, it was just even painful for me to think about the character letting go, you know, and that to me had to do with my own letting go, so. Right. It's powerful. Right. Thank you. What about you? Resolve, apology, acceptance, like what happens with you with your right? Because you are definitely an autobiogra autobiographical artist. 
Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, back in the day, I used to use Facebook, and I just used to just vent everything that was on my mind. And, uh, <laughs> you were and one of those. And eventually they kicked me off, literally <laughs> kicked me off Facebook. And He's said, been you banned not permanently from Facebook. Facebook. You won't find so, it there. Yeah, I'm not on it. But, um, <laughs> so then I'd, put, I'd, I'd take Tumblr, and I'd post some of my rants on there, and just my thoughts and my little essays. And, and for every song that, you know, I've recorded and played, there's like 15 others that, you know, just like these... Like, I'm not ready to revisit those and polish them yet because that's shit probably nobody needs to hear about or wants to hear about. And then eventually when you're ready, you kind of pick those songs back up or, you know, that writing back up and, and get back into it because eventually you're going to have to you compartmentalize and put these things in little boxes. And that's what the military does for you. They teach you how to suck it up, compartmentalize all that emotional shit, and then you're expected to be superhuman. And you get back and you sign a release to say, I'm good, I don't need to talk to the doc. You know, I'm, I don't have any problems with what I did over there and I'm not having bad dreams. Because if you do sign that paperwork and say that you did, then you can't do your job when you get back. And everybody thinks, this guy's a weak link. Now he's got, we got some mental case going to the, you know, the doc to talk so we can't even do our job because we got one man out. So, and that's another thing, you know, you just learn to internalize and compartmentalize. So for me, writing that stuff out and, and just pouring it out there it's, and, and getting, you know, at least something that can appeal to the masses out of it, or just to, at least the, that's what I look forward to, is to actually hear people say, yeah, man, that song's a good song because I totally relate to it. I, I, holy crap, mm -hmm. you know? And that's when you're like, you're good, man, so I'm not alone, you know? And it's, that's what we just want, to connect ultimately mm -hmm. so is there any resolution I don't know I think every day is a constant battle to find resolution in yourself you know from morning to night <laughs> so at the end of the day you lay down your head and think eh, today was a good day or I was probably an asshole today <laughs> <laughs> and I owe some people some apologies so, you know that kind of thing I think the connection that's the thing I love the most that Operation Encore has tried to do is that you know, veterans aren't these caricatures, you know, PTSD ridden, punching out walls. Like, they're people with human experiences that you have human experiences, they experience loss, and we all respond the same way, right? And, um, and that connection that happens, you know, the human connection that starts to happen, which is really the human condition between me and you, and my experience is not that different than yours, though the situation may have been different. All right, so we're gonna hear some music, and um, Zach, you're up. No pressure. So, yeah. So, oh, actually, so. no, no, no. I was gonna have you play words. Okay, I words can do Words first. That. Sorry, because the song, song. <laughs> this autobiographical song about like what words do. Yeah. Sorry, Zach. You're next, though. You're next. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. <laughs> me first. Me first. Me first. <laughs> this is called the words. Um. Yeah, this, as John Wade would say, this story of my life in three and a half minutes. Sense of melody and 
And I remember long nights before she turned out the light as she would sing to me. She said the man she knew before they went and sent him to that war, he was a different guy. I swear he used to spin me on the floor, never leave me wanting more until it felt like I could fly. It's like he didn't need a reason, he was free to close his eyes, pretend it didn't matter, to live beyond the lies, and he starts to feel the shiver, and so begin to rise, and drips in the water heaven, tears well in his eyes, and it feels so good when he'd sing the word, when he On the files, we can cry about the heartache. Let be on the walls, and we will overcome the demons. At least it's how it seems when our voices lift the spirit. From a whisper to a scream, we can sing about elation. A focus on the files, and we can cry about the heartache. Let be on the walls, and we will overcome our demons. At least it's how it seems when our voices lift the spirit. From a whisper to a scream, and it feels so.
music, man. It like you guys are haunting me. It's so good. I personally like music is such an infusion in like everything I do. Like it's a date timestamp, right? Like I hear a song and I'm like, ooh, I'm back in high school. <laughs> like it's it's crazy how music and words, books, movies, like they do that for you. Art does that for you. And um, so Cynthia, I'm gonna ask you this, like this music, like for me, I have playlists for everything. I have a playlist for every piece I'm writing, which is kind of silly, but like, I'm like, ooh, this song like inspires the scene. Like how does music like infuse into your work or your life? Yeah, um, well, I don't typically write to music because I get so emotionally caught up in music and I can't <laughs> write fast enough to go with the emotion of the song. So like I either have, so, but I do always um, use music to get me to feel an emotion that I want, like, um, or get me to think about something. So like if I hear a song, like I had playlists for all of my books, most of my books, um, I um, probably out of like the eight that I have published, seven playlists, right? Um, and I would listen to music um, on my on my drive to where I was gonna work or, and if any of those songs come out on the radio, I will immediately think of the characters, the story, I'll be right back there. It's just like a connection that I that I have with it. And um, the last time we say goodbye, I had a lot of music, like musical elements of it too, because I, I think I use a lot of songs in the stories. I'm always constantly having to ask my, uh, editors to get permission for me to use. Well, I read that, like, in your work. Yeah, so I'm curious about that, because you do put song, you do date time stamp. All of them. And yeah. evoke, you know, emotion in your reader through music and your writing. Yeah, um, I, some of that with that book particularly was because my brother loved music, and, um, and I wanted some of those songs to be in the, so like, uh, he, he was a huge Led Zeppelin fan, um, and that song, is is a big or uh, um, stairway to heaven uh, it was a song that he listened to over and over and so I wanted that element in in the book and I had to had to go get permission which is tricky <laughs> like you can use a certain amount of lines but like not over a certain amount and like the way that 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 worked out but um yeah I've always I've always sort of annoyed my my editor actually with how <laughs> how much actual music I want to incorporate into the into the um, book that I'm writing and, and what I'm working with and that that's true of all of all of the books I've done because I think of I think of music as being part of your experience um, I'm not I play a little bit of banjo and um, and I grew up playing piano and I play my uh, my grandmother sort of handed down this this beautiful old piano to me and I um, play that as sort of stress relief um, and so I've I think I've just always had emotional connection with music, and and uh, and so that just goes into the writing. My characters all have, you know, experiences with music too. So. And I think like music transports you. Like I have, I think fifty two playlists on Spotify, right? So I have the ones that like, I'm in the depths of despair and I'm sobbing, and I have nothing to be sad over, but I'm like listening to that playlist and it puts me there, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm happy, but there's nothing going right in my life right now. But music does that, and with you guys as musical artists, like, how does that impact your music? That's what I'm really curious about. I listen. About. To, I listen to tons of music. Still, I feel sorry for my neighbors because I <laughs> sing my balls off in the shower. <laughs> but I sing constantly, and it's like I know they hate it. But you know, like, I have playlists for everything too, and I have angry playlists too. Like when mm -hmm. I'm mad at work, because I go to this job where I can put in headphones and just do my job, right, and not associate or talk to anybody because that's just what I wanted to do after I got out of the military for a little while. And uh, I'll have what, something I'm really mad about. I'll put it in that thing, because you just you want to wallow in it when you're in there. You're selfish. You want to wallow in those emotions. When you want to painful music or you want to be sad, you're just determined. You're going to listen to sad music, because you want to feel, I think. And, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, so. yeah, you want to feel. That's powerful. Yeah. I have no anger. I just <laughs> <laughs> no anger at all. I, uh, 
viciously road rage. I scream at people all the time. I'm like the happiest person But now. you tried to get everyone in old Chicago to strike. So. I did try to get uh, an entire restaurant to strike. And I almost had them. You had them. You did have them. Yeah, the proletariat. Let's get it. And, um, yeah, I listen to music all constantly. My The bass player in our band, Zach, uh, Thompson, he he does this thing where he'll walk up to people and he's like, hey, have you ever heard of this thing called music? And, <laughs> and people don't know if he's joking or not. He's like, I just heard music today. <laughs> <laughs> and people are so weirded out. But I I have met people that don't listen to music at all and I just I don't understand it. Music has played such a big role in my life. And growing up around it, like, my sister and I used to dance around the Christmas tree to old like Christmas songs, and like, my dad is a pastor and plays plays music in the church band, so it's just it's always been around, and I absolutely love I love being friends with musicians as well, because then it's I don't know. You get inspired also when you come in, especially in Operation Encore, just coming in contact with these other guys because they'll you know they'll just play their song and you'll be like. I wish I had written that. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing music. Man. I've been yeah. hacking his laptop. I, we're all I have all <laughs> yeah. we're I Nixon bugged his uh, hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearing everything. We all like that. Though. We all want that. We see each other and we're like, I wish I'd play like you, man. I mean, we, we get those compliments from each other all the time. Yeah. Just, Writer envy is a good thing. Yeah. You know, it I is. think it's a good thing to like to see something or read, like, I'll read a book that has, like, a perfect ending, and I'll just be like, oh, <laughs> I wish I'd written that, you know? I right? that, but I didn't think of it in time. Motivation, yeah. And I think, too, like, there's, I want to hear about how music and words influence you, like, the impact that they leave. Like, there, there are certain books that I will read over and over and over. Sometimes it's, it's just for the cadence of the book. Like I'm like entranced and I'm like in a dream, right? And I want to hear about your experience with, with that, with how that influences your art and your music to push it out there. Like your best influencers or, yeah, is there somebody like to you being? Um, well, I, I listen, I read for sound and I read for like, sort of the beauty of the words too like this makes me sort of annoying as a co-author I write these books with these uh, other other writers and uh, and I am always paying attention to like how the words sound and like there is some there is a music in in writing novels and in prose too that I like to hear that and the first author that I ever heard that was Harper Lee like I when I was younger in high school and I was reading To Kill a Mockingbird. I think that was the first time that I ever heard the music in in the words. Like, heard that cadence. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and realized that writing was something more than just story. It was more than just telling a bunch of things that happened, but that there was a sense of art to it and, and choice and, uh, you know, the sort of beauty in, in the way that the words came out themselves. For me, it's just like a musical mixtape of my life. It's both songs, they all say something that you wish you could say, and they say it in a way that just, yes, that's what I want to say. It's like it's making, you know, the song, sending a song to a girl or a girlfriend kind of thing. Like, I don't know how to say this, but whoever wrote this song is <laughs> yeah. Here, listen to this Here. guy. <laughs> and so those become, you know, just the musical roadmap of your life, you know, they become, like you said, part of you. So when you hear that song, it takes you right back to that emotion, right back to that feeling, because it's like, I remember when I first heard this, and I heard that that's exactly what I wanted to say, but I could never put it into my own words, mm -hmm. you know? They, they said it way better. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'd just be piggybacking. No, I, 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 I have music that I listen to, and I'm like, oh, that's the first time I did this, or the first time I did that. Um... <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I have, like, go-to books and go-to songs, right? Like, my go-to book is Anything by Anthony Doerr, oh. right? I can read his stuff, and I'm like, oh, 
oh, it's like he's rocking me. Like I'm so happy in that little space, no matter how horrible war is or whatever he's talking about. And there's some music that does that to me too, and it's typically acoustic, right? But it puts me in the space that I love to be in. And then there's other spaces that I'm like, I need to feel really angry to write this. And so I'll play that song. Like I need to feel that emotion to be able to write about it, right? And I guess that's what I'm asking. Like, do you have to get yourself in that space or are you already in that space and you're like, I gotta get this out of me? I have to work myself up to write. Mm -hmm. um, I'll get like one or two lines. I'll be like, oh, okay. Like the song that we're now all three writing yeah. together. Yeah, uh, Novocaine. You're going like to hear Novocaine. about it later. We're writing, <laughs> we're co-offering a song. Yeah. That's all I'm so going to tell I, you. <laughs> how I write, I mean, I just take that thing and kind of compound on that. Or like write a chorus and then do what Tom Petty did and just play the same chord. Like, all right, we'll figure out where that's going to go. And just <laughs> write it. And I'll usually record um, audio and just play and mess up and take that 15 seconds of like a 10 minute thing and be like, oh, that's where that should go. Yeah, my phone has like a thousand voice messages, just me recording little parts of song. Like take 96, take 97. <laughs> but that's what you're talking about, writing specifically. I don't know, what about music you listen to? Like, do you have, do you keep like a playlist of yourself for yourself like it's strictly personal or mind you or are you there yet <laughs> <laughs> well you, I, I guess i just i don't know like i have a zillion spotify playlists for different reasons but yeah. like for emotions but do you make playlists too or oh uh, yeah certain bands specifically for you? no it's songs yeah. like i have the pull the curtains playlist it's what I don't yeah. want to hang out with anybody. I just <laughs> put that on, and I'm like, All the curds, yeah. I think Spotify has really refined that. I get my corn cob pipe and yeah. a bathrobe and <laughs> Pandora. When I first heard Pandora, I thought that was such a brilliant idea. When you hear a song, I was like, well, if you like this, check out this next one. You know, it was giving you references, and I got a lot of like great music recommendations from that kind of. So I think, yeah, in the era of musical apps and how people listen to music anymore, it's definitely broaden your horizons to hear stuff similar to what you already like mm -hmm. and then those kind of become personal and for me I, I discover these new artists and I'm like I want to be able to write songs like that and try to phrase my wording I don't know we're not similar necessarily not fight for me but we all steal from each other for sure and just maybe the rhythm or the cadence or the way you worded something or you know, the clever way you can uh, use an adjective or something you know it's, I, I feel like man I, yeah, I'm going to try something like that you know but make it my own so they become motivational to write. And with you, Honestly. Cynthia, like for me, listening to music, it's like that made me feel this way, and then I'm gonna try to do that in words on the page. Mm -hmm. Like, is that what? It, yeah, that's exactly. Okay, that's exactly how I do. It. Unless, unless it's a song that I that I think is actually in the book, right? <laughs> in which okay. case, you know. But like, uh, uh, but but yeah, I, I I pick playlists for their emotions and. And, uh, and, and to represent the character too, you know, sometimes um, my character will have a song, you know, that, that embodies them and makes me think about them. Yeah, and I think the difference, like you get to create a character, but I'm my character, right? So it's like, right. oh, all of this is about me, right? <laughs> so there's a little bit of a difference where you can, you have a little more latitude and you can go, well, I don't want my character to feel that way. Or do you do that? Like, I, do you, do you I have, do would you try have to do that. Okay. <laughs> my characters feel how they're going to feel, I guess, you know, like. A, so you don't have as much choice. No, I mean, I think if you build a character well enough, they kind of, you just have to follow along behind them and see what they do. Um, and I think, or if you just, like, even the idea of building a character is a little bit problematic that way, you know, but like, a, yeah, I think my characters sort of take hold and go do what they want to do. And, they're and so they complex. feel how they're going to feel, yeah. Yeah. So what we're going to do, we're going to wrap up with these three artists. They're going to compile something that is going to be amazing. Cynthia's going to read, and Zach and Steve are going to play in the background. And
tuning. It's the tuning side. Tuning. And I'm just so grateful to be here with you guys. This is awesome. And um, this is a scene from close to the end of the book, The Last Time We Say Goodbye. And um, it takes place in... So at the throughout the book, um, Lex is the main character's name. She's been asked by her therapist to write a in a journal and um, to to just write about her brother. And she kind of resists this at first, and then um, he tells he tells her to write about the first and the last because we believe we uh, we remember those things. Because at, at some point when you're sort of deep in the grief, you kind of forget. Like, it's hard to even remember any other thing but the grief, right? And so she's working through that. And then at the end of the book, she sort of has a revelation about, about how she feels about this. And she writes um, an entry in her journal that is to this boy that she was dating when her brother died and that she's since broken up with. So um, she's speaking to him, in, and she's talking about um, the night that her brother died and and uh, trying to help him to understand how she sees it. So that is the you. The you that she's talking to is Stephen. And it takes place in a, a planetarium. Okay. We were sitting on a red plaid blanket, like we were having a picnic in the woods, with two short white candles burning in the center, and a bottle of sparkling cider in a bucket of ice, and two plastic champagne glasses. On the planetarium ceiling, thousands of tiny blue lights shone down on us, not stars or constellations, but particles. It's from the show on Dark Matter, he said. I craned my neck to gaze up. I thought Dark Matter was invisible. You leaned back and put your arm around me and I relaxed into the heat of your body. It is invisible, he said. Well, theoretically it is. We can only truly conceive of the fact that, that it's there because of the way the galaxies behave as they move through the universe and how the light will always bend around it. He looked down at my lips. I knew you were going to kiss me. Your breath, which smelled like lemons, bathed my face. Anyway, he murmured, it's pretty. You kissed me. I curled my hand around the, I curled my hand around the back of your head, your hair soft under my fingers, and kissed you back. Blue lights spun over our heads. You kissed the corner of my mouth, my cheek, my ear. I smiled. So, this is romantic. Yes, I wanted to be romantic. You laced your fingers with mine. It's December 20th, you announced. And on June 20th, I kissed you for the very first time. So happy six months, which is precisely 183 days. You consulted your watch, which is 4,392 hours, which is 263,520 minutes, which have been some of the best minutes of my life so far. God, you were sexy, irresistible. I pulled your head down to kiss you again, but my phone suddenly buzzed. I took it out and looked at it. It was a text. I never told you who it was from. I never said, it's my brother. I never told you what it said. All this time, and I've never told anyone. But I'll tell you now. It said, hey sis, can you talk? This is the part where unra reality unravels for me. The part where I turned the phone off and slid it away from me and we went back to kissing. But there's an alternate version of what happened that night. There always will be for me. In the alternate version of reality, I get the text and I tell you, hold that thought, and I kiss you quick, once on the mouth, and then I get up and take the phone to the hallway and I call Ty. In that reality, which I know isn't a reality but a fantasy, wishful thinking, a prayer that goes unanswered, Ty tells me what I need to know, that he is sad, that he's stuck, that he's lost the future. Then I tell him that he's strong enough to get through the sadness. I tell him I don't want to go through this messed up world without him, and I tell him that I need him. I tell him mom needs him. I tell him even dad needs him. He may not see that right now, but he will see it sometime. I tell him that in five more days it will be Christmas, and I remind him that Christmas is his favorite holiday, and we'll wake up early and bounce up and down on mom's bed like we did when we were little, and we'll belt out silver bells as we scurry downstairs to the Christmas tree and unwrap our presents. And I got him something good this year, and doesn't he want to find out what it is? I tell him that we have a minimum of 63 Christmases left to share with each other, and I don't want to miss even one of those. Not one. I tell him I love him, and me telling him those things, 
is enough to slay his demons. And he lives. He lives through the night. He lives. But instead, I turned my phone off and I kissed you. We stretched out under the dark matter, that invisible, improvable stuff that binds the universe, and I looked up at you, all framed in blue lights, and I said that I loved you. Your eyes flashed with surprise. You didn't expect me to say it. You thought I didn't believe in love, but you didn't hesitate to answer. I love you too, you said. Then we drank the cider and talked about dark matter and talked about how we are all made of the stuff of stars. That wonderful quote from Carl Sagan, we are each part of the universe. We kissed and time bent around us. Time went away. But somewhere in those missing seconds, my brother was walking into the dark cocoon of the garage with dad's old hunting rifle and a bullet I must have overlooked. Regardless of your experience, like you might not have experienced that specific thing that you can relate. Do you have one more piece to read? Um, I, I mean, yeah, sure, I can. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we'll end on that. Do you guys want to play with her? Not play with her, but play along. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So yeah, this this spot comes earlier um, in that same book. Um, okay. I walked to the vending machine in the corner and fished out a crinkled dollar. I missed breakfast, i.e. mom didn't get to make it, and I didn't have the energy to pour myself a bowl of cereal. I put the dollar in, the machine spits it out. I put it in, it spits it out. Come on, I plead, I require sustenance. Not that there's anything good in the machine to eat. Dried fruit, granola bars, whole grain pretzels, organic gluten-free seaweed chips. This is Nebraska for crying out loud. Land of meat, potatoes, corn, corn, and corn as the five basic food groups. I'm suddenly stuck, struck by the memory of Ty standing in this exact spot, banging on this exact machine until a bag of dried apricots dropped into the slot. He picked it up, scowled. I don't care what the first lady says, he complained loudly enough that the people around us started nodding in agreement. This is not a Pop-Tart. I need my junk food, man. How's a growing boy to survive on all this healthy stuff? Am I right? He's right. My throat closes. I miss him. I miss him. I miss him. The hole in my chest explodes. I can't breathe, I can't breathe. There are people waiting for the machine behind me, so I don't have time to let the hole pass on its own. I stumble to the side and force my legs to move away down the hall to the restroom, where I almost run to the last stall and sit down on the lid of the toilet and bend my head over my knees and gasp and gasp and think maybe this drug thing they've suggested isn't a bad idea after all. I'm not doing well here, clearly. When the hole fills in again, my body feels achy, like I'm coming down with something. I flush the toilet as if I was in there for a good reason. I go out, take off my glasses, and splash some water on my face. The girls on either side of me don't say anything, they just return to meticulously washing their hands. I lean forward to take a long look at myself in the mirror. There are dark circles under my eyes, and my lips are chapped and colorless. I swipe at a wet tendril of hair that's clinging to my forehead, but then it just sticks to a different spot. The whites of my eyes look like road maps, veiny and red-rimmed and swollen, like I've been crying, even though I haven't been crying. I look wrecked. This whole thing has warped me, I think. I'm a board left out in the rain, and it's impossible to go back to being straight and undamaged ever again. This is who I am now. The girl whose brother died. So thank you so much, all thank three you. of you, for sharing, for being vulnerable, for being brave, for putting hard, uncomfortable things out into the world and creating conversation. And um, if you want, Cynthia has the books here. You can get a signed copy and um, make sure you connect with these two musicians because they have CDs in the world and you'll want to hear their stuff in the future. So thank you so much, all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.